Assalamu alaikum. <clears throat> Thank you for joining us today for this uh, fourth webinar on issues related to anti-bullying uh, that we are focusing on here at ICNA Council for Social Justice. Uh, this is our fourth webinar in a series of webinars that we are doing. Um, today we have Dr. Uh, Raisa Manijwala, who's a, who has a doctorate degree in clinical psychology from La Salle University in, 20, uh, in 2017. Uh, she currently works as a postdoctoral fellow at a forensic state hospital in Virginia. Her dissertation study focused on Islamophobia and religious microaggressions on the university campus. Um, she, we're, we're very glad to have her, uh, and she has a great presentation for us on this very important topic. Uh, as always, and as we have discussed in our previous webinars as well, uh, we are doing a monthly webinar on anti-bullying uh, so please join us next month as well and you can find all our previous webinars on our website www.icnacsj.org so from here i'm going to uh, basically hand it out to dr raisa assalamu alaikum assalamu alaikum and hello everyone thank you for joining the webinar on the stop bullying series um, I'm, uh, I would like to thank ICNA Council for Social Justice for letting me pre present my dissertation study to all of you today. So I'll be presenting my study titled Microaggressions Against Muslim Women on University Campuses. So you all can follow along with my presentation today on the PowerPoint slides. So I will share my screen with you. All right, so let's get started. So a little background about the Muslim American population and Islamophobia. So according to the Pew Research Center, there's approximately three and a half million Muslim Americans living right in the US as of 2017. And this is supposedly an underestimate because the US Census Bureau does not ask questions about religious affiliation. And so it's expected to be a, a bit higher than that. And this population of Muslim Americans is expected to double by the year 2050. Um, and a little bit about Islamophobia. So what exactly is Islamophobia? So Islamophobia is the unreasonable dislike or fear of and prejudice against Muslims or Islam. So this term actually was coined before 9-11. So there were two waves of Islamophobia in the United States. So the first wave was basically in post 9-11. So the hate crimes increased by 1600% in the few months after September 11th, 2001. The second wave of Islamophobia was during the 2016 US presidential campaign. So excluding post 9-11, hate crimes at this time were higher than any other time in US history. Okay, before we get to the school setting and Muslim students, uh, I'd like to briefly highlight religious discrimination towards Muslim Americans in different settings. So for instance, in the US government, um, the National Security Surveillance Program, uh, the New York Police Department engaged in religious profiling and unconstitutional monitoring of American Muslim communities without any concrete links to terrorism. There were also unlawful and indefinite incarcerations of presumed potential terrorists that were entirely Muslim. And there were also discriminatory visa screenings that made it more difficult for Muslims to gain entry into the United States. Um, the mosque setting, so, the Pew Research Center had statistics about mosque vandalism. So there was a nationwide study survey conducted where 15% of the Muslim participants reported that their mosques had been vandalized in the past year. So the survey was done in 2011. 
And there have also been conflicts over mosque construction in the US. As you know, probably about in 2010, there was a controversy about the Ground Zero Mosque being constructed in Lower Manhattan. So this is a microaggression that um, sends the message that Muslims do not belong in America if there's controversy of mosques being constructed in the US. Um, the employment setting, so post 9-11, um, there was a 250% increase in religious-based discrimination charges. So employment discrimination includes things like exclusion from job interviews, alienation from colleagues, loss of jobs, and things of that nature. Uh, the leisure setting, so this includes recreational areas such as beaches, parks, and campgrounds, and other places um, where Muslims received things such as unpleasant looks, threats, vandalism, and physical attacks. And as a result, uh, many Muslims changed their leisure activities, such as not traveling by airplane, but instead by car. Um, and finally, getting to the school setting. So youth have encountered religious discrimination and harassment by not only other students, but also teachers and school administrators. For example, uh, teachers mocking the Muslim call to prayer or other students generalizing all Muslims as terrorists are examples of discrimination that research has seen that youth have experienced. And not only young children have been the targets of religious discrimination, but also graduate students have experienced exclusion and lack of a supportive social environment for religious practices and holiday celebrations. For instance, still having tests and exams on religious holidays and not having a prayer space. So youth from a young age all the way to being a graduate student have experienced some form of religious discrimination. So a little bit about the impact of religious discrimination on mental health. So there has been a physical impact as well as a, a more of an emotional impact of discrimination. So many, uh, the research has shown that many Muslims have experienced high levels of stress due to being a target of Islamophobia. They have also experienced a study in 2009 showed that 70% of 102 Muslim participants reported post-traumatic symptoms post 9-11, such as increased arousal, fatigue, and anxiety. And even though um, many Muslims experience this kinds of, kind of an impact, they usually avoided seeking therapy and usually in fear of experiencing discrimination by professionals, medical and mental health professionals, unfortunately. Um, but fortunately, many Muslims have coped in a positive way from their experiences of discrimination by engaging in interfaith activities as well as outreach activities with the larger community. They've provided educational materials to educate others about Islam and also religious coping by prayer, reading the Quran and things like that to help them deal with their experiences. Okay, so what exactly is a microaggression? You may have heard this term, you may, might not have, but this is basically modern day discrimination or racism, uh, or also known as contemporary racism. So a microaggression, the definition of that is brief and commonplace daily verbal, behavioral, and environmental indignities, whether intentional or unintentional, that communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative racial slights and insults that potentially have harmful or unpleasant psychological impact on the target person or group. So as you can see the image, the woman to your right, um, on the slide. Um, so this is a, a question that somebody has asked her. And so for instance, somebody asked her, you were born in Canada? 
So the message that this statement sends to this Muslim woman is that because she is a Muslim, she can't possibly be from Canada and that Muslims are in a way foreign and might not speak English. So these are the kinds of implicit messages that can be sent from somebody's statement. Um, so given that individuals often observe one's physical appearance to make assumptions about one's background, targets may find it difficult to identify which demographic aspect was the major cause of the discrimination. So for instance, the woman on the previous slide, she might not know if that question was asked because she's Muslim or because of her ethnic identity. So a lot of Muslims in the literature have found since it can be so subtle, many people can be confused whether or not they experienced a microaggression or a discriminatory comment. Individual differences. So individual differences may contribute to one's perception of a situation or act as discriminatory. So people with a strong group identification, strong sense of nationalism, or a strong ethnic ident identification are more likely to report personal experiences of discrimination and perceive themselves as targets of discrimination. So there are different types of religious microaggressions that have been supported in the microaggression literature. So, the first category of microaggressions is endorsing religious stereotypes. So this is statements or behaviors that communicate false or incorrect perceptions of a certain religious group. For example, um, believing that all Muslims are terrorists is an example of a religious stereotype that people might hold. The second one is exoticization. So this is where instances where people view other religions as trendy or foreign and sends the message that such religions are ones that can be played with instead of treating them as sacred. The third one is pathology of different religious groups. So these are statements and behaviors in which individuals equate certain religious practices or traditions as being deviant. An example of this is somebody telling you that fasting is abnormal or wrong. So if you're telling somebody you're fasting for Ramadan and somebody is saying, oh, that's really abnormal or that's not healthy or that's wrong. So that's kind of fits into that category of pathology of, of Muslims. So the fourth one is assumption of religious homogeneity. So this one includes statements in which individuals assume that everyone in a given religious group looks, behaves, and thinks exactly the same way. So an example of this is that all Muslim women wear hijab. So it kind of disregards the diversity, the racial diversity of Muslims, um, the, the physical appearance of, of different Muslims. So it kind of... Um, implies that all Muslims think, behave, and look the same way. So the fifth category is assumption of one's own religious identity as the norm. So this one includes comments or behaviors that convey people's presumption that their religion is the standard and behaves accordingly. So for instance, somebody telling a Muslim person Merry Christmas can send the message that um, Christianity is the norm, and that's what we practice here in America, and it might make might be hurtful some, for someone that they don't recognize that people can be practice other religions besides Christianity. So those are the six categories of religious microaggressions that people can encounter. Um, so moving on to my study. Um, so the purpose and significance of this research study. So as you can see, there's few studies, particularly on microaggressions towards the Muslim population. It's mostly more overt um, discrimination towards Muslims. And there weren't many Muslim 
um, studies on Muslim American students in general on the campus. Since many, since college students spend a lot of their time on campus, it's important to understand their experiences while they're at school in this setting. So the purpose is to explore, describe, and understand the experiences and perceptions of religious discrimination among Muslim American college students. And particularly for this study, I interviewed um, Muslim female students who are undergraduate students of South Asian descent. So a little bit about the method and the research design. So this was a qualitative research study, which means that I interviewed these participants about their stories of discrimination and to get really an in-depth, um, really to understand their in-depth experiences. And I use transcendental phenomenology. This is a particular research design where I examined what the participants experienced and how they experienced it in what context. And I also examined from those experiences, I saw the common experiences of these participants and what they experienced together. And it was a semi-structured questionnaire that I created, which asked about their academic setting, like for instance, their classes with students and professors. Also, if they had an on-campus job, I asked them about their employment setting and also, also social settings where they went to extracurricular activities on campus. So I explored the variety of um, roles that these students have on campus. The recruitment process, these students were from five local medium to large universities in urban settings of the Northeast region in particular. So this was the flyer that I posted on university campuses, trying to recruit a Muslim women to share their experiences. Um, they were compensated with a $10 gift card to Barnes and Noble. So the inclusion criteria for this study the, um, these participants self-identified as Muslim. They self-identified as South Asian, where their family were originally from the South Asian countries. Um, they were at least 18 years old, were enrolled at an undergraduate institution, self-identified as female, and each of them perceived to have experienced at least one incident of religious-based discrimination, particularly on the university campus. And all of them could felt comfortable speaking in the English language for the interview. So again, it was an individual face-to-face -face interview. Um, I asked them about their religious identity, how important Islam was to them, their definition of discrimination. I also asked them about their experiences of be being treated equally on the campus. I asked them about experiencing religious microaggressions in those different settings, academic, social, and employment setting. These interviews were audio recorded so that I could transcribe them, and they were about one hour to one and a half hour long. After the interview, I gave them a brief demographic questionnaire where I asked for their age, marital status, country, family origin, the languages they spoke, the, their number of years living in the US, citizenship status as a US student or international student, and their level in college. So coming to the results of the study, so just a little bit about the participants' background. I did get 12 participants in my study. They were an average age of 19.75 years old. Um, they were all actually U.S. students born and raised in, in the U.S., and they were from the freshman to senior level in college, so all levels in college. So the country of family origin, it turned out that six of the participants, their families were from Pakistan, and six of the participants, their families were from Bangladesh. And um, an observation was the majority of the participants did not wear religious attire, such as a hijab or a burqa. They all mentioned that Islam is a central aspect of their identity, so they had strong group identification. And pretty much um, they all agreed that their 
definition of discrimination is treating an individual differently based on their appearance and or background and not giving people equal opportunities because they're a certain sex, race, religion, or sexual orientation. And it's important to note that the participants felt accepted the majority of the time that they were on campus. So the experiences they were talking about were um, the minority of their experiences. Okay, so coming to the themes that I found, so I transcribed all 12 of their interviews and I looked at all of the interviews in depth and across the 12 interviews, I found seven themes that occurred. So the first, the first three are from the micro, supported by the microaggression literature. So they were pathology of different religious groups, assumption of religious homogeneity, endorsing religious stereotypes, which I talked about earlier. And there were also four new themes that I found, a belief that Islamophobia is common and will continue, confusion, a desire to educate others about Islam, and positive coping and support. So I'll talk about these in more detail. So the first theme, pathology of different religious groups. So um, I will give you some quotes that the participants shared with me. So one participant mentioned receiving stares on campus and this particular student was um, wearing hijab or a headscarf to cover her hair. So she mentioned receiving a stare by another classmate and she said, you think of yourself as a normal person and then you're reminded that you're not. So this stare by a classmate kind of sending the message to her that she's abnormal or that she's weird or wrong in some way for being Muslim or wearing a headscarf that Muslim women usually wear. Another participant mentioned um, that she was in class and her friend was massaging her hand. And she said, after I told my friend in class that I'm Muslim, he let go of my hand and stopped massaging it. After I told him I'm Muslim, he never talked to me. So this was a case of overt discrimination where the student um, pretty much never talked to her again solely because he learned that she was a Muslim. Another participant mentioned um, my hijabi friend and I were taking the university shuttle bus back to her apartment right off campus and we got this look and it made my skin crawl. This look was that bad. This was specifically like in a judgmental tone, you're a Muslim. So as you can see, these statements by other students sent the message to these Muslim participants that they were somehow abnormal or somehow wrong to be Muslim and, and, and felt um, discriminated against. The second theme is assumption of religious homogeneity. So a participant mentioned standing at a campus bus stop where a woman um, was speaking to her and the participant said, she obviously did not expect to hear perfect English from me because to her, I guess I did not look like I would be able to speak proper English. So this was particularly a participant who wore a burqa or um, religious attire um, that looks like a gown to cover the um, student's figure. So she mentioned that this woman, just by looking at her, didn't think she would be from America, didn't think she would be speaking English because she looked a Muslim. So another participant mentioned, um, a professor mentioned a generalized comment about Muslims in Muslim countries. So she mentioned, I think sometimes people assume that when they say Muslim countries, they also mean everyone who comes from these Muslim countries. It feels kind of strange. It feels kind of targeting. At times it can feel like they're talking about you or your family. So as you can see, these students felt like they were um, generalized to being similar to all other Muslims from Muslim countries or all Muslims don't speak English or are foreign. The third theme was endorsing religious stereotypes. Um, so a particular student mentioned 
a professor in particular had said the quote, terrorists are towel heads. And towel heads is a derogatory term for Muslims or Arabs who wear a turban. Um, so she said that a professor had mentioned this comment in front of class. Another student mentioned, a friend told me a student walked by the table of Muslim students and shouted, it's ISIS, it's ISIS. So this particular statement sending the message that all Muslims are terrorists, and obviously that being a stereotype that that student was holding. Another participant mentioned working in a group for a class project, and she mentioned in the middle of preparing for our presentation, my group member just randomly asks me, so I heard about the bombing in or terrorist attack in some Middle Eastern country. So why are you people always trying to bomb people? So as you can see, these statements from classmates send the message that they hold these stereotypes about Muslims being terrorists. And obviously these were hurtful comments for, for these participants. The fourth theme is a belief that Islamophobia is common and will continue. So a particular per student mentioned that her professor said the comment in class that African and Asian countries cannot govern themselves. So after this comment, the student said, I feel on edge like whenever it becomes a controversial topic in class, it's like, oh no, they're about to whip out something wild I'm going to have to live with. So this particular participant mentioning basically that she expects comments discriminatory to Muslims or Islam to come up in class and that she'll have to remember these types of comments that were particularly distressing for her. Another um, student mentioned, after this experience, I felt very insulted and I again felt that feeling of, wow, things are going to be very hard for me in the future. This kind of feeling like I'm being held back. So this student feeling like Islamophobia is going to continue and it's going to be hard for me while living my life and possibly being held back um, because of these types of experiences. The fifth theme was confusion. Um, so one student mentioned that a student had said something about, they were discussing the Iraq war and she felt um, like this classmate um, had a statement about the way she reacted about her stance on the Iraq war. So she said, but after my classmate made that comment, I was like, should I not have said what I said? Should I not have defended my people? So pretty much doubting her own responses to these microaggressions. So another student mentioned, while he was staring, I thought, oh my God, is this really happening? Is what I'm thinking actually happening? So this is the student who felt stared at by another student on the university shuttle bus and kind of taking, um, being confused about if she was really experiencing a discriminatory act by his stare. Um, so a lot of these students described not understanding the incident, wondering why they were being treated differently, and feeling uncertain of how to respond and unsure of their responses. So this can be a cumulative impact by being confused about these types of discriminatory acts. So the sixth theme is a desire to educate others about Islam. Um, so a lot of students mentioned feeling pressured and responsible to educate others about Islam. And they felt responsible for representing an entire faith. So one student mentioned, I think it goes both ways. Sometimes when events happen, it's nice to be able to speak out about Islam and then have people support you in that. But then at the same time, I just want to live my life and go to my classes, go to a party or something, and not have to worry about, okay, let me make sure I'm representing Islam perfectly every single time I step out of my house. I'm just a college kid. Most of us are just college kids. That's not a responsibility I should have on my shoulders. So as you can see, the student thought it was um, somewhat of an opportunity to teach others about Islam. 
However, um, they felt overwhelmed um, about representing Islam and feeling as if they're a spokesperson for an entire religion. Another student mentioned, when someone asks you, what are you? Then I become hesitant because I want to know their stance on Muslims first because I want to portray myself better before I have to tell them. So this kind of gets at feeling the need to prove themselves to people, trying to make an extra effort to be nice or an extra effort to be friendly, just because if they, the person finds out that they're Muslim, they know that they don't represent the minority of um, Muslims who might be perceived as extremist or a terrorist. So feeling as if they had to prove that they were a normal person who can be nice and friendly and still be Muslim at the same time. So the seventh theme is positive coping and support. So fortunately, a lot of the participants coped in a positive manner. So one student mentioned, after this experience, I've gone out to way more diversity events, way more politically active events, just because it was the first big thing that I felt obligated to go to all these things for. Since then, I've gone to everything. Um, Another student mentioned a prof the professor who said a discriminatory statement. She said that she filled out a course evaluation after the course was over. And she said she mentioned in the evaluation that she said there are just some things that you said throughout the semester that have no, I feel like you should consider what you said and think about it a little bit. It's not that it makes you a bad person or a bad teacher because I think you're a good one. I was polite, I, was, I wasn't off-putting. So as you can see, they dealt with these experiences mostly in a positive manner, which was good to see. Um, so a little bit about, in a general sense, what the participants experienced. Um, so a lot of them used words such as stared, ignorant, lonely, unfair, judged, confused, pressured, and targeting. So the participants felt that people had an ignorance about Islam and that they felt a responsibility to educate others about Islam. A lot of them mentioned Islamophobia is real and discrimination is going to exist, so pretty much expecting that to exist throughout their lives. A lot of them had feelings of exclusion and feelings of confusion and doubt, which we talked about earlier. The structural description, so this is basically how the participants experience these discriminatory acts and statements and in what context. So the participants mentioned experiencing these statements in classrooms, university shuttle buses, at their on-campus jobs, libraries, social events, club meetings, and the university's Muslim Student Association social media webpage. So as you can see, they were in different settings across the campus. They experienced uh, these statements by students as well as professors, and they received support from family, friends, and other professors they felt they could confide in. And the participants mentioned they felt like these were actually learning moments about themselves and about their desire to educate others. And a lot of them felt like they wanted to get more involved in their own Muslim community and also support other minority groups. So the essence or common experience of all the participants was that they felt generalized and felt judged by those who have a limited understanding of Islam and that family, friends, and professors can be sources of support. So a little discussion about the results that we found. So there was no support for passing um, and passing is um, those Muslims who might not wear religious attire might pass as not Muslim. So um, they might experience different amounts or types of microaggressions. But since most of the participants did not wear religious attire, they still experienced uh, microaggressions against them. Um, so all of the participants mentioned that they strongly identified with Islam. So they um, felt that they were targets 
of discrimination. And the results support three themes from the microaggression literature, which we talked about. And the four additional themes that emerged were feelings of confusion, um, feeling a desire to educate others and take a proactive stance, as well as feeling as if Islamophobia is a common phenomenon in American society. Limitations and implications for research and practice. So this is really important because it shows how we can use the results of this study to um, provide a safer environment, improve the well-being of Muslim students on campus and, and in general for Muslim students. So some limitations first I'd like to talk about um, was the small sample size of 12 participants. So in the future, uh, more research studies need to be done to understand Muslim students' experiences of Islamophobia and of microaggressions. It's also important to um, conduct research with students in different geographic areas. This was particularly in the Northeast, um, but different geographic areas would be important to examine to see if their experiences are different and to also research um, Muslims of different ethnic and racial and gender groups. So this was particularly female students of South Asian descent. So obviously um, black Muslims can have different experiences from South Asian Muslims or Arab Muslims, et cetera. And um, this was particularly with females. So it would be interesting for other research to examine the experiences of Muslim male students. Um, so educational programs. So given that universities influence social and intellectual growth of students, administrators have an obligation to enhance the racial climate on the university campus. So it is really important for universities to implement educational programs for students, faculty, and administration to increase awareness about microaggressions and their impact and, and the impact it can demonstrate, which can demonstrate a commitment to combating microaggressions on the university campus. So for example, courses on world religions can be important to raise awareness cultural competency training for professors and school administrators can be very important to implement. So because the participants mentioned, they just felt like a lot of the times people were ignorant about Islam, educating people about Islam can be very crucial and very important to combating these microaggressions on campus. Also, it's important for mental health professionals at university and college counseling centers to understand discrimination of Muslim students um, that they may encounter, be aware of their own biases against Muslims, and provide culturally sensitive interventions for those Muslim students who do come to the counseling center and seek help from these professional providers. So, with that said, these therapists can help these Muslim students develop coping strategies, healthy coping strategies if they do experience discrimination and microaggressions, and to help empower these students to advocate for Muslim students and other minority groups to really enhance the racial climate on campus. So additionally, university counselors can take initiatives to create inner group dialogue among students to foster social justice, attitudes, self-reflection, and empathy and understanding. Altogether, educating students, professors, and mental health professionals can ultimately develop a safer environment and improve the well-being of Muslim college students and other students of minority groups on campus. So these implications are very important because it shows how our research results can be um, and how we can take action upon these research results and studies. Okay, so if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. 
at Raisa M786 at gmail.com. That's R A I S A M 786 at gmail.com. Thank you again for joining our webinar for the Stop Bullying webinar series. And thank you again to the ICNA Council for Social Justice for letting me share my research results with all of you so that I can share these results and these implications that are so important for us to take as a Muslim community here in America. Um, thank you so much um, for joining us today. Okay, okay, thank, thank you, you uh, uh, so, so much, much Raisa. Raisa. Uh, uh, that was actually really good. And I hope people learn from it and they're able to carry on the message that you presented uh, in the webinar. So please share with your family and friends all the details that were shared in the webinar. Um, you can also find this webinar on our website, uh, inshallah, by tomorrow, uh, www.ignacsj.org. Uh, you saw the slide with uh, her contact information. So if you have any questions, please let her know. Um, and please join us again next month for another webinar on bullying. Now, we are also doing anti-bullying uh, anti workshops for students and parents. Uh, where we teach you how to respond to bullying, what to do if you are bullied, what to do if you see someone being bullied, uh, and what your kids can do, what parents can do, uh, what teachers should do. So if you are interested, uh, please email us at info at ignacsj.org, and we can help uh, schedule something up with you uh, in your community. Um, and that's it. Thank you for joining us. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu, and we'll see you next month.